At that time, which we're talking about early 1990s, the success of, of watercraft aftermarket was heavily driven by race success. You had to, they say, a win on Sunday, sell on Monday. So we, I went to Yamaha Motor Corporation and I said, guys, I'd like to put together a Yamaha race team because there's all these Kawasaki race teams out there. I want to have a Yamaha race team. They gave me a $300,000 budget, which was huge money back then. And I hired some top watercraft racing pros. We went out there and we, we really kicked ass on the national tour, which was a tour that went around the United States. It was televised on ESPN at the time. And we got worldwide recognition for this Riva racing brand. At the time it was called Riva Yamaha because we were only doing Yamaha parts for Yamaha waiver. And our part sales just took off. People ordering from Japan, Europe, all around the world wanted these Reba parts because we put them on these watercraft and they were winning races. I'm Dave Bamnis. I'm the uh, president and partner at Reba Motorsports and Reba Racing. We're a Florida-based business down here in South, sunny South Florida. Okay. And Dave, can you tell us a little bit of how the business kind of started? Sure. So the business started in 1979. It started a small family business. My father founded it in 1979, selling motor scooters, mopeds, you know, small motorized bikes. In 1979, we were selling Yamaha racing go-karts. Little, little business in the strip center we had started with just my mom and dad. I was in high school. I was assembling bikes in the back, back room and it grew from there. It grew into what it is today, we have, I won't get ahead of myself, but we have over 200 employees, four locations, and it's a big monster now. Gotcha. In those early days of like, uh, the weird thing is I always heard uh, about the business through other people. And I thought it started as like, uh, you were selling kind of skateboards, kind of like that was kind of your hobby at the time. And you were also selling that aspect of it. Was Is that true? Well, that's that's part of our history. Um, you know, like, I've always been a skateboarder, still am a 60 year old skateboarder. But um, when I, I went away to college and when I came back from college, my idea was to, it, the dealership was going, we're selling sco lots of scooters, you know, the family business was going. And uh, this is uh, mid 1980s. And I was a skateboarder, a competitive skateboarder. I was traveling around the country, you know, and skating in contests. So my idea was to open a skateboard shop within the family business. I convinced my dad, hey, we're selling motor scooters, but let's have a skateboard shop over here. And it's going to bring in this whole different crowd of people. And sure, it brought in a bunch of punk rock dudes and you know, all kinds of people. But it, um, we saw, I think it helped the business mix, you know, and like the skate shop chugged along for about five years, I'd say from like 1985 till 1990, within the walls of uh, Reba, which was at that time called Lambretta South. Uh, that's another story. But um, Reba had a skateboard shop in it for five years. And that was because of my passion for skateboarding. But I'd say early 1990s, I figured it out that the square footage was skateboarding was going through a downturn. And um, it's from a business standpoint. So I figured that this is better for my recreational you know, hobby. Skateboarding is for me, but for business, I really constantly started concentrated 100% on the family business, which was Reba at the time. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, going into like scooters, I'm guessing they're back then they were Chinese scooters. I don't think you guys were doing Yamaha and stuff like that, were you? No, this is before the attack of the Chinese scooters. This, the, the, the scooters were all Japanese scooters. So it was, we were a Yamaha scooter dealer. And that's actually where we got the name of our business because the original line of Yamaha scooters were called. Reba scooters by Yamaha. So we were Reba World. And that's where we got our name. And we sold hundreds and hundreds of Yamaha, Reba Yamaha scooters. And uh, after, after a few years, Yamaha dropped the Reba name for their scooters. They just called Yamaha scooters, but we retained that name. So our business became, it went from Reba World to Reba Yamaha to Reba Motorsports, where we went multi line with lots of different brands of motorsports products. And I know you were pretty young when the business was kind of starting. You're in high school, but do you remember any times that it was uh, financially difficult for you guys? I mean, I know your dad was starting out. How did he kind of even jump into the business one? And like, was it easy at first? Like, were you guys able to kind of make money right away? Um, he he definitely went through his struggles. Um, he took loans and he did whatever he needed to do to make it happen, to buy inventory and, and to pay the rent. 
before we owned our own buildings. So, um, you know, I was putting, putting, uh, four kids through college and, and everything he had to do. So, uh, he pulled it off. And when I returned from college and I went full time into the business at that time, we probably had about, I'm guessing maybe 15 employees by that time. And, um, we went through periods of rapid growth. Uh, one of the big turns for our business was in the late 1980s, like around 1987, Yamaha came out with their watercraft line, the Yamaha Wave Runner, which was their first personal watercraft. For those of your viewers who don't know what a personal watercraft is, that's traditionally called a jet ski. You know that, Dustin. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, you know, Kawasaki made the jet ski, Yamaha made Wave Runners, BRP makes sea dupes. So we became a Yamaha Wave Runner dealer when they first began in 1987. And that was really our, our business just skyrocketed. We quickly became the largest volume Yamaha Wave Runner dealer in the world, selling hundreds and hundreds of Wave Runners. And um, we just took off. And at that time, you're kind of doing that. I feel I wasn't around that those years, but I feel like it was a very competitive sport. Like I think there was like big sponsors like Budweiser's and different stuff like that that were coming into that sport. And uh, how did that kind of like propel you guys ahead and like kind of make you guys a, a big uh, franchise, not franchise, but a big, big business? Well, you're talking about the racing aspect of the sport when you said Budweiser and stuff, because they did yeah, yeah. The, the national tour. So let, let's, let's back up. Y Yamaha introduced these, this, these wave runner lines, which were sit down models. At the time when Yamaha introduced that, Kawasaki had already been in the market for many years making these stand up jet skis. And those were being raced for, for many years prior to Yamaha getting into the market. And so the, the industry was dominated by Kawasaki. We were not a Kawasaki dealer. We, we were a Yamaha dealer. And uh, when we entered the market just as a Yamaha dealer, I saw the opportunity to start an aftermarket division to make performance parts and accessories for Yamaha Wave Runners. Because this was already a, a raging market for the Kawasaki jet skis. There was, there was, I don't know, probably a hundred different companies making go fast parts for Kawasaki jet skis, you know, air filters, exhaust systems. It parallels the automotive performance market, but it was for jet skis. But nobody was doing anything for Yamaha. So I saw an opportunity and I assembled a group. This is the early 1990s, around um, 92. And I hired some really good development people and people that were very familiar with high performance modifications from the Kawasaki world. I said, okay, guys, you're coming to work for me and we're going to work on Yamaha watercraft and we're going to make stuff for Yamaha. There was only one other player in, in California called ProTech that was involved in making Yamaha stuff. So it was sort of um, low hanging fruit. Oh, you know, it was, it, there was no competition in this Yamaha performance market. So we came in there and we, we, we grew very quickly in that area. Gotcha. And as like a business owner, what makes you take those risks? Meaning like you did the skateboard thing, kind of seen it didn't work, but you know, most people would consider that, oh, that's a failure. You know, like uh, you stop something that you started. And I talked to a lot of business owners that, you know, take the same risk. Like you saw an opportunity there, but nobody ha was doing it. So there's no proof of record that says like, this is going to work for you. Like what makes you kind of take those risks and, and kind of jump forward? Well, what, what really excited me was, was, was being involved with designing products that were unique where I knew there was a need for something. And I, I, I just felt that it would succeed. My actually, my first experience was with, with before the wave runners, when we were selling the Yamaha scooters, um, I worked with a company that designed exhaust systems and we made an exhaust system for a Yamaha scooter. And we sold hundreds and hundreds of them. And we sold them through a little magazine ad. This is you know, pre-internet, you know. So people were ordering these exhaust pipes to make their scooters go faster. And as the scooter thing died off and we got into the Wave Runners, I had that in the back of my mind. I'm like, we could make parts for Yamaha Wave Runners. There's you know, thousands of people buying these things and there's nobody supplying, hardly anybody supplying performance parts. And um, obviously I had to talk to my family about... Um, the investment is a family business, but uh, they gave me a shot and I, I brought people on board and we quickly saw the success. Now, at that time, which we're talking about early 1990s, the success of, of Watercraft Aftermarket was heavily driven by race success. You had to, as they say, a win on Sunday, sell on Monday. So we, we, uh, I went to Yamaha Motor Corporation and I said, guys, I'd like to put together a Yamaha race team because there's all these Kawasaki race teams out there. I want to have a Yamaha race team. 
This is 1993. They gave me a $300,000 budget, which was huge money back then. And I hired some top watercraft racing pros. We went out there and we, we really kicked ass on the national tour, which was a tour that went around the United States. It was televised on ESPN at the time. And we got worldwide recognition for this Riva racing brand. At the time, it was called Riva Yamaha because we were only doing Yamaha parts for Yamaha Wave And our part sales just took off. People ordering from, from um, Japan, Europe, all around the world wanted these Riva parts because we put them on these watercraft and they were winning races. And then uh, kind of when the, the racing kind of dies out, it does never dies out because I know they're still doing it today, but when it, it's not as big and you kind of stopped doing the racing, what made you kind of prevail? Because I know like uh, there's a lot, a couple companies, I don't know if r and still around or not, but I feel like there's a, a, a couple companies that, you know, went out of business in this, this niche uh, uh, market that you guys kind of kept moving forward. What kind of makes you move forward from there? Right. The, the, there was two major turning points for our aftermarket business. And I, I just want to take a pause here, Dustin, and, and kind of just define for your listeners. My business has two major parts. We have dealers, a dealership, which is Reva Motorsports, which is a traditional dealership. You can walk in and buy vehicles, motorcycles, personal watercraft, ATVs. That, that's Reva Motorsports, the dealership. And then we have Reva Racing, which is the aftermarket parts division. So we have both going on. We actually have four dealerships now in South Florida. And then Reva Racing, which is based in Pompano Beach, Florida. Reva Racing has 700 dealers worldwide. But going back to your, your question, it was such a race-driven market, these aftermarket parts. And when racing died down uh, right around 2000, 2001, uh, it, it kind of fell apart. The, the big U.S. racing tour fell apart. The television coverage fell apart. The manufacturers pulled their money out of race sponsorships. And I had that was a pivotal point for me because all of my competitors in this aftermarket watercraft parts business, I would say 85% of them vaporized within 24 months. They just these companies have been around for 10 years, 15 years, just disappeared because racing was gone. So they figured racing's gone. So we don't have a we don't need to make racing parts anymore. And they went and did other things. So I took my group of development people and sales team and said, guys, we are gonna now switch gears. And we're going to make recreational performance parts for middle middle class people that just want to go fast. You know, these are doctors, lawyers, people who just want to beat their body on the lake. And um, we developed a whole line of recreational performance parts, still making the hot, you know, the high end race parts for for the racers that were still out there. But we could still advertise they were race proven parts. But this recreational performance business quickly eclipsed any kind of. Um, racing business that we we're doing before because there's many more recreational users than there are racers out there. And, you know, as uh, you know, this is what, I guess, 15, 20 years into the business, was there any big pivotal moments that kind of happened that um, you guys didn't think Reva was going to make it or any, anything that kind of happened that was a big struggle for you while you were there? Well, we're going to separate Reva Motorsports from Reva Racing because they're two different, different but, but yeah. uh, first we'll talk about Reva Racing. Uh, that first pivotal moment we just described when racing died, and I had to sit down and say, "Guys, do we do we hang up or you know do we hang it up or do we keep moving and move it to the recreational performance parts?" So we did that, and that was successful. The next pivotal moment for Reva Racing was a few years later when there was a huge shift in technology in these personal watercraft engines due to uh, the EPA requiring these things to be cleaner. The Environmental Protection Agency they. The engines went from two-stroke engines, which are the old ones we had to mix the gas and oil, to four-stroke engines. Four-stroke engines are cleaner, they're quieter, but um, we all of our technology at that time was to make two-stroke engines faster because all the personal watercraft were two-stroke. And when everything shifted to four-stroke, um, again, any just about any competitors that we had left really exited the market and said, "Oh, everything's four-stroke now. They're heavy. They're slower. They're we don't know how to work on them." And and these. Uh, most of my competitors left. This is around 2003, 2004. And again, we doubled down. We invested in more testing equipment, a dyno center, which is a, a device that measures the horsepower of engines, and uh, brought in some four-stroke ac experts into our team that could take the four-stroke technology to the next level with superchargers and turbochargers and moving into the four-stroke world. So that was a, a pivotal technology thing. It, it, it's a, in the automotive world, it's the equivalent of going from gasoline cars to electric cars. It was that big of a shift that 
you know, some people just didn't know how to deal with it. So they left the market as far as my competitors were. So with, with Reba Racing, making the transition to four stroke, which was uh, embracing the new technology was important. And then the next, the next big part of growth, which was not, which was the plus side, that, that was not a challenge is when we went multi-brand. So in the, in the early 2000s, we went from being Reba Yamaha to Reba Racing as far as the performance parts. And we started making parts for other brands like c and Kawasaki. And that doubled our business because we were not just making parts for one brand. And we're still obviously multi-brand today. It, it, moving over to Reba Motorsports, the dealership, after we got out of the, you know, the, the early struggles that my parents went through, you know, financing a small business and getting it up and rolling, I think the next big issue was around 2008 when the, you know, the world had this big economic downturn. It was a big, this was going to a, a depression. And what happened in the motorsports world with these dealerships, these motorcycle and, and, and watercraft dealerships is hundreds and hundreds went out of business. They just went out of business. So a lot of these dealerships were leveraged too much. They had too much finance, too big mortgages. They couldn't, with the decrease in business, they couldn't cover their expenses. So there was a mass attrition in our industry of dealerships going out of business. 2008 through 2011, a lot of dealerships went out. And we were very fortunate that my father taught us to always have a strong cut cash balance and always have, you know, good assets to fall back on for, for slow times. We did not ever over leverage ourselves. So we were, you know, most of our buildings were had a lot of equity in them and we were in a position to ride through those hard times. We we're actually in a position for growth because an opportunity happened in Miami where a, a dealership went out of business around 2000, 2008. And we were able to uh, start a new Reba location, Reba Miami, on the footprint of that dealership because he didn't have the, um, he wasn't able to make it through those times. Gotcha. And um, as you're kind of like uh, growing the business more, is there anything, I, I mean, I know you personally, because I, I used to work for you, but you know, I know your dad loves collecting Porsches. Like that's his big thing. That's what he spends like uh, his money on. But was there anything that you bought big when you first started making uh, good money that you know, like, where did you ever have an eye on a Rolex or a car? I kind of already know the answer to that, but is there anything that you bought that you were really interested in? Um, I'm a boat guy. You know, I always you know, like I like to cruise with my family in, in boats. Like, so like when I, you know, back then I when when I started when we started being more successful, I had more funds to work with. I bought a uh, an old trawler, an old 42 foot trawler that I renovated and cruised with my wife and son and. And that moved into other boats, but I've always had boats that I've spent my disposable income on. But um, other than that, you know, my hobbies like skateboarding don't cost too much money. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, and then, you know, uh, how do you kind of stick out from other businesses? Like what makes you guys different? Like, is there something in your marketing? Is it something like that you're unique, that you're only making, uh, you know, products that nobody else is making? What guy makes you guys unique from other not motorsports, but uh, performance uh, companies. Well, I think I, what, what turns me on the most, what, what, what excites me every morning when I wake up to go to work is, is the creative opportunities in this business. And whether, whether it be the Reva Motorsports or the Reva Racing side, we're always looking like, how can we be different? What, what can we create that, that is different? So when it comes to the Reva Racing side, that's, I may, that's my creative outlet, sitting with my development team and saying, what kind of cool new products can we come up with? We're, we're about to launch a, a marine audio um, line, which is like big speakers, bass and boom for your for your jet ski and, and wave runner and, and seed. So that's coming out. In addition to the performance parts, we're developing recreational accessories. And we're also moving into the jet boat line with Reba Racing. So that's an added division. So that's um, a creative outlet that, that I enjoy and it also differentiates us from other businesses by coming up with unique products. On the Reba Motorsports side, on the dealership side, dealership, we try to be different in our marketing. We have a marketing department that you used to be part of, Dustin, when you, you worked for us. So um, you were our webmaster for many years, I believe. Yeah, among that's other right. things. Among other yeah. things. So we have a, a great marketing crew, and I enjoy working with them for to, to send our marketing messages out for Reba Motorsports. You know, you got to be goofy, and you got to wake people up on social media and do different stuff all the time. So I, I enjoy working with those guys for you know, whether it's a funny video or whether it's a, a neat slogan, but um, growing our dealership footprint in South Florida is also exciting for us because 
We have a store in Key Largo now, you know, Riva, Riva South in Key Largo. We have Riva Miami. We have Riva Deerfield Beach or Pompano Beach, which is where Riva Racing is located, as well as the dealership. And then we have a new fourth location in Titusville, Florida, which we call Riva Space Coast. So that is that. We just opened that dealership about a year ago, and that covered our northern flank. So together, having this, this dealer group of Riva Motorsports stores and developing a, a cohesive online presence where the websites, you know, all look similar. So, you know, you're in the same dealer group and you can click back and forth between dealerships and just going with that whole South Florida theme, you know, get out on the water. The water is waiting. That's our latest slogan. The water is waiting. And, um, you know, my last question would be like, uh, for like a new business owner, what advice would you give them? Or like, what would three tips that you would give a new business owner? I would say the tips I would give a new business owner, number one, make sure that you're, that you're well financed, that you can cover staying in business for long enough to achieve your dream. And that might mean whether it be getting the loan or working with um, whatever assets you have to make sure, because a lot of people have great ideas they can't get off the ground because they don't have the finances to see it through, whether it be seeing it through the development cycle or the marketing cycle, make sure you have the finances to pull it off or, a par- or get a partner that has the finances to pull it off. Next thing I would say is make sure it's something that you love and enjoy. I mean, there's, there's people that go to work every day and hate what they do. And those people are trapped. I mean, the money that they're making, if they, if, if they hate what they're doing and they're working seven or eight hours a day or 10 hours a day doing something they don't enjoy, I don't consider that person success. That's just, that's my opinion. I love what I do. So I, I come into work and I feel I'm successful every day, whether I happen to make money that day or not. Also, you know, I would also say for people that are going into business, really enjoy the relationships that you develop in that business, whether it be with your employees, whether it be with your customers or your vendors, because these, you know, again, we're, we're at work for eight to 10 hours a day. And you bust an ass, those human relationships are very important to me. And that gives me a lot of joy to come into work every day and, and be interacting with, with other humans and, and just being a human. You know, having having good relationships with people. 